Hello and very good evening to all of you. In the previous lectures, we were discussing about the sustainable development. And in the continuity of that sustainable development, today we are going to discuss in the context of the climate change regarding the little bit uh, uh, history uh, of the or various developments uh, taken under the UNFCCC in a relation with the sustainable development and we will discuss little more also and in today's chapter we will also discuss about uh, the efforts done by India in the context of the sustainable development. So this today's lecture is again important, not only in the context of the economy, this is important in the context of the environment, climate change, general studies prelims paper, general study means paper, paper two, paper three, paper one and paper four also, and the essay paper as well. So be focused, be attentive in today's lecture again, right? So as far as the, uh, this uh, sustainable development is concerned, so we discussed uh, in our uh, previous lectures that uh, sustainable development is that model of development where the natural resources or the economic resources of the country are used in such a manner so that uh, the capacity of the next generations to meet their needs right or uh, to live a standard of uh, at least that we are living today should not be compromised uh, so that method of development, that model of development is known as the sustainable development. Right? So in today's lecture, we are starting with the climate change uh, timeline, we can say, you know, climate change efforts timeline, and India's intended nationally determined contributions in the context of the Paris climate, uh, which were uh, which was concluded in 2015, right? So we are going to discuss all thing, everything. So first of all, uh, you know, because in the previous lecture, we discussed about the Rio Earth Summit, that it was the Rio Earth Summit, which was held in 1992, that uh, bring into focus the issue of sustainable development, the concept of sustainable development in the world, right? And uh, there were three important uh, conventions which were the outcomes of the Rio Earth Summit. One convention was Convention on uh, Biological Diversity, which came into effect in 1993. And the second convention was, uh, that is the United Nations Framework Convention on uh, Climate Change, which came, which came into effect uh, in 1994. And the uh, Third was the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD, which is known as like that. And uh, this convention uh, came into uh, effect from 1995, right? So uh, under the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the very first uh, uh, you can say event uh, which is considered very important in terms of the climate change efforts of the world, right? That is known as the Kyoto Protocol. So first important thing is that uh, Kyoto Protocol was concluded in the COP3. Please note it down. Kyoto Protocol was concluded in COP3. COP means Conference of Parties 3, means third Conference of Parties, 
which was held in December 1997 in that conference of parties, right, which was held in Kyoto, a city in Japan, right? So in that, uh, you can say conference, it was decided uh, that uh, uh, there should be global efforts with some fixed target to reduce the emission of the greenhouse gases and that outcome, that protocol, that agreement which was signed, that agreement is known as the, we can say, that is known as the Kyoto Protocol, right? So that is important in this context, uh, we can say about this. So now the thing was that, uh, what is the Kyoto Protocol, right? So, so this is important to know that uh, what is the Kyoto Protocol, right? So as far as the Kyoto Protocol is concerned, right? So in terms of the Kyoto Protocol, it can be said that uh, Kyoto Protocol was adopted on, uh, Kyoto Protocol was adopted on 11th of uh, December, right? 1997 in COP3, right? So please bear this in mind that uh, Kyoto Protocol was adopted in, in COP3 on 11th of December, right? Conference of Parties 3 on 11th of December, it, wa it was adopted there, right? And the second important thing is that uh, the Kyoto Protocol came into force on 16th of February, 2005, right? So very important post point, very important question here, which requires to be discussed here in the class is that uh, the Kyoto Protocol, which came into force, uh, uh, sorry, which was entered into the year 1990, uh, you can say this seven, right? And uh, it took so many years for the Kyoto Protocol to come into effect. What is the reason behind that? So this is a very important point because uh, you know that uh, whenever some international agreement uh, is signed, whenever some international agreement it is entered into, then after that, uh, right, there is a, a requirement of uh, ratification by at least a minimum number of countries to bring that uh, uh, agreement into force, right? So the, so the Kyoto Protocol, which was entered into in 1997, right? So it takes, it took so many years, right? For the agreement to be ratified by the uh, required number of countries, right? To bring it into force. And that is why uh, it took uh, so, um, so much time for the Kyoto Protocol to come into force, right? So please bear this in mind. Kyoto Protocol number one was discussed and finalized at COP3, which was held in December 1997 at the place Kyoto in Japan, right? And the Kyoto Protocol came into force in 2005. So these two points are important, right? And apart from that, uh, in the Kyoto Protocol, under the Kyoto Protocol, we see that there are two phases of the Kyoto Protocol. One is the phase one of Kyoto Protocol and second is the phase two of Kyoto Protocol, right? So as far as the phase one of Kyoto Protocol is concerned, right? So phase one of Kyoto Protocol is a, is a, uh, from 2008 to 2012 and uh, phase two of uh, Kyoto Protocol starts from 2013 and uh, it, you can say, ended in 2020. So it means, uh, please be at this in mind that there are uh, two phases of the Kyoto Protocol, right? So one phase of Kyoto Protocol is uh, from 2005 to 2008 and the second phase of Kyoto Protocol uh, sorry, one first phase is from 2008 to 2013, uh, sorry, 12, and the second phase of Kyoto Protocol is from 2013 to, 2000, uh, to 2020, right? So this, these are the two phases of the Kyoto Protocol. So in the 
first phase of Kyoto Protocol, the emission targets which were there, those were for the developed countries and for the economies in transition and for the economies of the European Union. So please bear this in mind that uh, under the Kyoto Protocol phase one, the emission targets and everything, right? The emission target and everything was, was uh, you can say, uh, for the developed economies, for the economies in transition, number one, number two, and number three, for the, uh, we can say, economies of the European Union, right? So, and the emission targets were, uh, we can say, to reduce the emission of the greenhouse gases by 5%, by average 5% of the emission levels, right, of the emission levels, right, uh, in 1990. It means uh, in this uh, Kyoto Protocol, the reference line, the reference period was 1990. The countries had to see the right emission of greenhouse gases in 1990, right? And uh, then the countries had to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, right? Uh, you can say, by 5% of the emissions in 1990 on average, right? So this was the target. So please bear this in mind. In this, there was an, uh, an extra B. Uh, there was a list, right? So in that, an extra B, 37 industrialized countries were included, 37 industrialized economies in transition, etc. Total 37 countries were there. And the responsibility, was shifted on those 37 industrialized nations to cut their emission of greenhouse gases, right? Uh, to avoid from the harmful effects of the climate change, right? So, and the developing economies like India, China, etc., those were uh, left free from any responsibility, right? So there was no obligation on the developing economies to consider any cut on the greenhouse gas emissions, right? So that was the point because uh, Kyoto Protocol was based on the concept of, uh, right? Uh, uh, was based on the concept of a common but differentiated responsibility, right? So this was declared in the that uh, Rio Declaration right in 27 principles this was one of the principles that uh, whatever the climate change pro uh, whatever the climate change mitigation program will the world is going to adopt in future that should be based on the common but differentiated responsibility common but differentiated responsibility means uh, right so it is the responsibility of uh, all the countries to uh, be responsible to think about the right uh, to think about reducing the emission of the greenhouse gases right to save the planet from the global warming or the harmful effects of the climate change but uh, though, though the responsibility is common of all but differentiated means uh, the more responsibility should be on those countries right which have contributed more into the global warming, which have contributed more into the environmental degradation or which are responsible for emitting more greenhouse gases and the countries which uh, are not uh, or which have uh, emitted less greenhouse gases, uh, right? So those countries uh, should share comparatively lesser responsibility. So that is the, uh, you can say common but shared responsibility. So in Kyoto Protocol, it was thought that uh, in Kyoto Protocol, it was thought that uh, the countries, right, which are the developed ones, right, they have, uh, uh, you can say, used the natural resources, they have uh, used the cheap fossil fuels, they have contributed uh, largely into the degradation of the environment, into the emission of the, uh, the global greenhouse gases, 
and they are responsible to a larger extent to the global warming. That is why those countries were held responsible only and that there was no responsibility on the developing country. So please note this, this is a very small point, right? So in the climate change mitigation journey of the world from the formation of the UNFCCC till today, so this is a very important milestone Kyoto Protocol is in that journey. And that is why I'm telling you all this, right? So uh, it means under Kyoto Protocol, number one, a COP3, right? Number two, Kyoto is a place in Japan, right? Number three, it came into effect in uh, 2005. Number four, the first phase of Kyoto Protocol is from 2008 to 2012 right and uh, number five the responsibility was fixed on the developed nations economies in transition and the economies of the european union only there was an annexed b in that 37 industrialized countries were mentioned and the responsibility of cutting the greenhouse gases was uh, put on those countries right the reference date was 1990 level emissions right emissions in 1990 and the right target was uh, right on average right to reduce the global emission of greenhouse gases by five percent of the 1990 levels so this was important thing in the context of the Kyoto protocol right so now the next thing which is important there that is the 2007 bali cop as far as the 2007 Bali COP is concerned in 2007 Bali Conference of Parties it means right so in that 2007 Bali Conference of Parties introduction of a nationally appropriate mitigation action to engage developing countries in voluntary mitigation effort right so by this year 2007 it was thought that if we want to uh, mitigate the effects of the global warming or mitigate the effects of the climate change, then we would have to right, fix some responsibility or we would have to, right, uh, you can say, make the developing countries also participating in this program. Right? So if we are leaving totally free for the developing countries that whatever greenhouse gases they may emit, Right, so there is no responsibility in those and the entire responsibility is fixed on the developed countries only. So, uh, uh, so, lead, so in the context of that, uh, the developed countries were not happy on that decision in the Kyoto Protocol because the entire responsibility was, uh, was fixed on those countries and those countries were thinking that uh, that, will that would hinder their uh, right development also so that was the reason that uh, usa did not ratify the kyoto protocol usa kept itself out from the kyoto protocol right and in 2010 uh, you can see canada also left the kyoto protocol right so the point is that uh, it means that developed countries of the industrialized countries were not ha happy they were taking it as a discriminatory action right or discriminatory uh, you can say plan right or uh, uh, some decision that is discriminating between the developed and the developing countries by uh, putting more burden on the developed countries right to uh, you can say mitigate the climate change in the world so that was there so that is why by 2007 in the bali conference of parties nationally appropriate mitigation action concept of that term of that was introduced so according to that uh, the governments of the uh, that of the developing countries right would also think about uh, mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions right or mitigating the climate change uh, right uh, effects so uh, but uh, that was left voluntary for the developing countries the purpose was only right to aware the developing countries that uh, uh, their responsibility is also there 
to save the planet, right? So they can, they also cannot be kept totally free from the responsibility. So that is why some burden should they share, right? Voluntarily according to their own wish, right? So it was uh, uh, resolved that uh, the governments of the developing countries, right? Would formulate the national plans, right? Would, uh, uh, you can say, plan the uh, mitigation, right, action, right, voluntarily. So that was the outcome of the Bali Conference of Parties. Then in 2008, the Kyoto Protocol 1, uh, first phase came into being, right, came into effect, was implemented. And then in 2009 and 10, this is a very important, uh, uh, you can say, term in the climate change mitigation efforts under the UNFCCC. Because uh, in this uh, COP 16 was held at, we can say, Kankan, right? So Kankan is a city in Moscow, Copenhagen is in Denmark, right? So, the, so we can say that uh, uh, that was there, right? So in the Conference of Parties 16, or 16th Conference of Parties, which was held at Kankan, right? So the difference between the developed and developing countries with respect to the global emission reduction was erased, was uh, diminished, right? So it means what is there was, uh, uh, you can say, right, taken away. It means uh, whatever the line was there between the developed and developing world before 2010, before the Kenkan meeting or COP 16 of the 2010, right? There was a line between the developed and developing countries. Both were uh, put in two categories, right? And the focus uh, was on the developed countries, right? To, uh, uh, right? to put the obligation on the developed countries, right? To own the responsibility of uh, damage to the environment and they should pay the price for that in terms of the cut in the global greenhouse gas emissions etc etc right but uh, by the year 2010 when the canton conference of parties was held it was thought that uh, no no this is not right so developing countries should also own the responsibility and that is why the line between the developed and developing countries was, we can say, erased and uh, the difference in terms were or with respect to the greenhouse gas emissions between the developed and developing countries. The, the two sets, right? So that was uh, erased, that was taken away, right? And uh, uh, you can say that was the important point, right? So, and uh, uh, developed countries, were no more under the obligation, you can say, to cut the emissions, right? So, because developed countries were not happy, they were demanding that uh, that this is injustice, right? So, whatever was decided in the Kyoto Protocol, and the developing countries will have to take on binding commitments. So, what was the outcome of the this? Uh, Cancun Conference of Parties 16, which was held in 2010. Number one, right? Number one, that means uh, uh, the difference between the developed and developing countries with respect to the global warming or the greenhouse gas emissions that was erased, number one. And number two, uh, number two, right? So we can say that uh, uh, developing countries, the right, uh, were to give some binding commitments. There were some binding commitments of the developing countries now to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and the developed world was kept free from the obligations, right? So this was the, uh, you can say, uh, total seed of, of, of the year 2010, right? So that is there, right? So now what is there? So the big term uh, which uh, the uh, Kenkan Conference of Parties brought, uh, that was that uh, uh, with the COP16, which was held at Kenkan, right, with that can Conference of Parties, the developing countries lose their right to grow with equal access to some extent, 
right? Because uh, uh, how did they lose their right to grow with equal access? Because uh, the developing countries were already grown, right? So they had uh, already, you can say, uh, uh, created injury to the environment, damage to the environment, right? So uh, degradation of the natural resources, degradation of the environment, right? And uh, at the cost of the whole world means uh, we people also, right? America is enjoying today a better uh, standard of living, right? And we are bidding for the uh, damage to the environment which America has caused, right? In the race for development. So that is the point, right? But uh, now what happened? The developing countries lose their right to grow with equal access to some extent. Equal access means uh, what is there, right? <coughs> so now there were binding obligations on the developing countries, right, to cut their greenhouse gas emissions to be more responsive about that, right? So that is why it was uh, not in the interest of the uh, developing countries. One point is that, and that was in the interest of the developed world. It's quite obvious, and they were happy with this decision. And second, the principle of a uh, common but differentiated responsibility was also compromised by in the Cancun, uh, you can say, conference of parties, which was held in 2010, right? So, because now the distinction between the developed and developing countries has been erased, but you know that the, the developed countries were more responsible for uh, the damage to the environment, right? So that is why Developed countries were supposed to be in more responsibility, but uh, that was compromised in the Cancun Conference of Parties some way. That is the second point, right? And now there is the, we can say, third, third important point, right? The only country, right? The only country that uh, objected to the Cancun COP decision, right? That was uh, Bolivia. Bolivia is a country in Central America, right? So Bolivia's contention was that, was that, right? Okay, this, this, this decision taken in the COP16 at Cancun, that is, uh, uh, you can say, harmful. That is against the interest of the developing countries and that is favoring the developed world, right? So the only country, Bolivia was there, which objected that that decision, which raised its voice against that decision, which was held at Kenkan, and uh, other countries of the world were supporting this Kenkan uh, decision, right? So that was the point, right? So uh, the Kenkan agreement, you, you please keep it noting, uh, the Kenkan agreement, right, recognized the need for limiting global temperature not to the not to right greater than uh, uh, right not to exceed uh, two degrees Celsius right of the pre-industrial levels and it also recognized uh, right if possible to limit the rise in global temperature uh, right uh, up to 1.5 degree Celsius right of the pre-industrial level so please bear this in mind the Paris Agreement, right, which has clear objective to limit the global warming, right, to two degrees Celsius, right, above the pre-industrial levels, and if possible, ideally, right, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius of the pre-industrial levels. So that which was adopted as a goal in Paris Agreement, uh, that was first talked about in this Cancun Conference of Parties in 2010. Please bear this in mind. This is very important question, right? Two degrees Celsius and 1.5 degrees Celsius points were first of all discussed in the Cancun Conference of Parties, but the only difference is that the Cancun Conference of Parties talked about limiting the right increase in global temperature average increase in global temperature 
not more than 2 degrees Celsius of the pre-industrial levels and ideally 1.55 degree, uh, right? But the Kenkan Conference of Parties did not prescribe any path, any route, right? Any mechanism for that, that how to reach there, right? So Kenkan Conference of Parties talked about the objective only of 2 degree and 1.5 degree Celsius but there was no path, no mechanism, no strategy prescribed by the Kenkan Conference of Parties. So, so that is the difference in, in Paris Agreement, right? Both those uh, goals were adopted, right? And, and a clear-cut strategy has also been worked out. So that is the difference between this, right? So, but uh, it is not uh, that it is for the first time that uh, this has been talked about uh, in the, you can say this, uh, this uh, Paris Agreement only, okay? So this point needs to be uh, kept in mind, okay? So that is there, right? And uh, the goal was uh, no emission targets for the developed countries, right? But the emission targets would be for the developing countries only, right? So this is there. After that, there is the Durban COP. Durban COP, uh, that was a COP 17, Conference of Parties 17, which was held in 2011, right? And uh, in this COP, and, uh, and we can say ad hoc working group, right, on Durban platform, which is known as ADP, ad hoc, AFR ad hoc working group on D for Durban P for platform, right? Ad hoc working group on a Durban platform, right? We can say that, right? That was launched for evolving an agreement for a post-2020 period, post-2020 period, because the, uh, this uh, Kyoto Protocol was going to end in uh, that uh, 2012. 2012, right? And uh, keeping a margin of some years in between, right? So it was, uh, uh, you can say, a new group, which is known as the Ad Hoc Working Group on Durban Platform, ADP, that was formed. And the role assigned to that group was uh, to work out a strategy or to work out a plan, to work out an agreement, for the post 2020 period, right? Uh, in, in the context of the climate change mitigation efforts, in the context of the mitiga mitigating the global warming, right? Or emission of the greenhouse gases reduction. So in that context, uh, right? ADP was given responsibility to evolve a new policy for that period, right? For post 2020. So that was the contribution of the Durban COP in the Paris Agreement, right? So contribution of a uh, Kenkan COP, right? Contribution of Durban COP. Then there will be contribution of Warsaw and Lama COPs as well. That's there, right? So then in 2012, right? In 2012, we can say, right? So there was a, another summit held, which is the, uh, we can say that is 18th summit, right it sorry 18th conference of parties which was there that was held in doha i think right so in that uh, uh, you can say that uh, conference of parties it was decided that uh, second phase of kyoto protocol would continue would start from 2012 and would continue till 2020 right so that is the second phase of Kyoto Protocol, right? And then there came the uh, Warsaw and Lima COPs, right? In Warsaw and uh, Lima COPs, Warsaw in Poland, Lima is also in Poland, both the countries and uh, uh, both the cities are in Poland, uh, right? So in Warsaw, what was there? It was decided that uh, all countries required to prepare INDCs and present them before COP21 in Paris. Uh, right, INDCs internationally, the, sorry, 
intended nationally determined contribution that is INDCs, right? So INDC means uh, every country would uh, right would uh, make its own plan, which will be known as nationally determined contribution regarding the cut in the greenhouse gases emissions in terms of the that uh, GDP of that country, right? And the country would uh, submit its uh, right voluntary contribution list uh, before the COP21, uh, which was held in Paris in 2015, in which the Paris Agreement was concluded, right? So that was there. And then uh, in Lima COP, which was in the next year, that is COP20, it was again held in 2013 in Poland, again, right? So its purpose was for uh, sorry, its contribution was that uh, Lima Conference of Parties right brought clarity on the form of uh, right IDC centric. Right, so we can say uh, their purpose was that uh, every country has different priorities. Right, so it is not necessary to make it uh, mandatory for a country to be INDC centric. No, a country may work out some different plan also right but that different plan should definitely contribute in uh, in right promoting the efforts right against the greenhouse gas emissions or against the increase in the global warming so that was their clarity on the uh, indcs right so warsaw said that uh, all the countries should prepare their INDCs and submit before the CO, before the COP15. Oh, sorry, COP21, which is going to be held in Paris in 2015, right? And uh, the Lima COP made clarity on the INDCs. Right, so the next point, which was there, right? So that was the, we can see, the next was the uh, 19th COP. All countries required to prepare INDCs and present them before COP21. At COP20 in, Lama 2000, in Lima 2014, further clarity on, on INDCs, right? So it means uh, what happened that uh, gradually, right, the more and more responsibility was fixed on the develop, developing countries, right? They were made more responsible so that is an important a very important thing in fact right so more responsibility was fixed on those countries right so beta uh, i'm telling you that uh, let us start from the kyoto protocol right the journey entire journey from kyoto protocol till we can say today right entire journey from kyoto protocol till this day so what is there in that entire journey? From Kyoto Protocol, we had a start, right? The responsibility was entirely on the developed countries, right? That, that was there. And by 2010, uh, in fact, uh, from 2007 onwards, right? It was thought that uh, the responsibility should be shifted to the, some of the responsibility should be shifted to the developing world also. And in 2010, right, uh, it during the Canton meet, right, so it was uh, resolved that uh, you can say, right, there is no difference between the developed and developing countries in terms of the this uh, greenhouse gas emissions, right, and the responsibility was shifted towards the developing world as well, right, and. Uh, in, and by the time 2015, you can say, right, all the developed and developing countries were held equally responsible, right? So, but yes, right, from the mandatory and binding commitments, so it leads to INDC's concept, nationally determined contributions concept that every country, according to its capacity, according to its uh, uh, level of technology according to its needs, right? So would, uh, uh, you can say, would design a strategy, right? A and would set the targets uh, 
and then those would be submitted before the conference of parties right at Paris. So that was that happened there, right? So how gradually it shifted from there to there, right? So it means uh, uh, in in the year 2013-14, that was the period of the, we can say, internationally determined contributions, right? Because in Warsaw, internationally determined contributions were discussed and in Lima, there was clarity on the internationally determined contributions, you can say. So this is an important decision in this respect. Okay. So it is it clear up to this point? Do you want to ask anything? Please send me message and tell me. Right. And if you want to ask anything, you can uh, speak also. Not an issue. Right. So all is open. Aman, Aman, are you... Is it clear? Any doubt? Tell me. Okay, clear, clear. Okay, good. Right. So, Aman, you also tell me, better. Not a problem. Okay. So now, let me move further. Okay. So, the next thing in this in today's lecture is that, uh, right? So, that is about the historical emissions, right? Since 1880 has resulted in rise in global temperature by 0 0.85 degrees Celsius. Today it is said that it is about 1 degree Celsius rise in the global temperature as compared with the uh, pre-industrial levels or uh, 1880, we compared it with that, right? So that is there, right? So what is the total rise in global temperature as compared with the 1880 level, that is approximately 1%, we can say, right? So historical carbon space occupied by various countries. Carbon space, what is the meaning of the carbon space, right? Carbon space means space-based measurement of carbon dioxide emitted by different countries, right? Carbon space occupation of carbon space. That means uh, uh, what is the emission of a country into the, uh, you can say, uh, what is emission of greenhouse gases of a country into the space, right? So that is termed as the carbon space, which is occupied that country in the space, right? So some countries are, uh, uh, you can say occupying the higher carbon space, some countries are occupying the less, thus the, you can say, right, less carbon space, we can say more or less, it is, it, it's, it's going on, right? So this data is quite old data, right? So I am uh, discussing with you some, uh, some new data, you please note it down, right? So uh, one is that, uh, make, a, make a heading that uh, emission, by countries by 2019. Emission by countries by 2019. Okay. So the first thing in this is that is the carbon dioxide emission in million metric tons, right? Country wise, carbon dioxide emission in million metric tons. Okay. Million metric tons, right? So that is the point, right? So now, now, what is the emission in terms of the million metric tons, right? So number one, China. Number one, China. China is the largest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases, right? In terms of the uh, total emission if we take into account, right? So it is that emission of the greenhouse gases converted into the equivalent carbon dioxide units. So that is there. So China's emission is a 10175, right? Uh, we can say million metric tons. This is the greenhouse gas emitted by China, right? China is the largest emitter in the world okay so after china the second country is the us us right so total emission by the us these are the annual emissions actually total emission by the us are 
5285 million metric tons right so second largest emitter of the greenhouse gases in the world that is usa right and the third largest emitter is our country india india right so greenhouse gas emission by india that is 2616 right million metric tons right so greenhouse gases emitted by india are 2616 million metric tons so this is the greenhouse gas emitted by india okay so it is at number 3 in the world and the fourth is russia with 1678 million metric tons 1678 million metric tons right and uh, the fifth largest emitter that is the japan with 1107 million metric tons right so it uh, please bear this in mind in terms of the total emission total annual emission of greenhouse gases by a country in the equivalent units of carbon dioxide the largest emitter is china second largest is usa third largest that is india fourth largest is russia and fifth largest is japan please bear this in mind and let us interpret it in some other way if it is asked that among the among the brics countries right the the largest emitter brics countries are five countries that is brazil russia india china and south africa so among the brics countries also the largest emitter is china and the second largest emitter among the brics country that is india okay china and india and if the question is asked that uh, right the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in south asia right so in south asia the largest emitter of greenhouse gases is obviously india right so india is the largest emitter of greenhouse gases in south asia right because china is not in south asia china falls in the we can say east asian countries china doesn't come in the category of the south asian countries so therefore among the south asia india is the largest emitter of the greenhouse gases that is there right and if it is asked that uh, in sarc group of countries south asian association for regional cooperation right so that is that is that is what uh, right so uh, that is also india because in the sarc group right sarc group uh, consists of this uh, india and its uh, surrounding countries right that is uh, sri lanka india uh, you can say maldives pakistan afghanistan nepal bhutan and bangladesh right so these are the we can say sarc countries right and then bimstek right bimstek bay of bengal initiative right for sectoral uh, technical and economic cooperation right bimstek right so in bimstek also india is the largest emitter of the greenhouse gases right so please take it like this right uh, so conceptually you should clear that uh, where does india fall india is in south asia and china is not in south asia you know that in india is the third largest emitter of the greenhouse gases the largest emitter is in uh, part of asia but that is not in the south asia and the second largest emitter is is in america right so you should differentiate this right from from your examination point of view that's important and uh, the next point is that uh, there is a per capita emission of greenhouse gases right so the largest emitter in terms of per capita emission of greenhouse gases right so it is a uh, mentioned in terms of the metric tons right in terms of metric tons right so in terms of metric tons right the largest uh, per capita emitter right the largest emitter per capita of greenhouse gases that is that is the largest is number 1 it is saudi arabia right the which is emitting 18 metric tons per person right 
greenhouse gases and the second largest emitter becomes australia which is emitting 17.27 metric ton and the third largest emitter is uh, canada which is emitting 15.69 right metric tons per head and the fourth largest emitter per head is us which is emitting 15.52 and the and the fifth largest emitter is south korea which is emitting 12.7 right 12.7 right metric tons per person right uh, that is there so i have discussed with you very important data world's largest five emitters are uh, china usa india russia and japan and uh, in per capita terms the world's largest emitters are uh, that is saudi arabia australia canada usa and south korea right so china is not uh, among the uh, largest emitters in terms of the per capita emission if we talk about india is also not among the top type emitter uh, top five emitters right so the next is uh, uh, the the thing is that india even though not part of the problem wants to be a part of the solution uh, this is a this is from our government website right so what our government feels that uh, india is not responsible for environmental degradation because the when the major loss to the environment happened in 1960s 70s or, or even before that after the pre industrial revolution this at that, at that time at, at that time right india was not in that position where the uh, consumption of the fossil fuels was so high or the emission of the greenhouse gases was so high because india's industry was also in very poor condition etc so means uh, india has not contributed into the emission of the greenhouse gases though right india is not responsible for the uh, uh, this increase in the global warming but still india wants to be a part of the solution right because india thinks that uh, that uh, the resources are, are the common and future is the need of everyone right though the damage was uh, uh, caused more by the usa caused more by other countries right but still right future is the need of india also right so that is why if 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 we want a better future better better future if we want a healthy future right so then india should also be part of the solution right whatever has happened in the history that's gone right so uh, that's why india's intention is to be a part of the solution right so the next uh, important thing is that uh, that is the uh, right uh, that is emission by countries, which I have uh, mentioned here, that what was the emission by countries, right? So we have uh, discussed that emission by countries now, right? So after emission by countries, now we are coming on the national circumstances and challenges in India. As far as the national circumstances and challenges in India is concerned, according to the government, uh, we are owning 2.4 percent of world surface area it means what is whatever the total self surface area of the world exists out of that uh, india holds only 2.4 percent of the world surface area that means uh, uh, one fortieth part of the surface area is being uh, you can say held by india right but india is hosting 17.5% of world's human population. See, right, approximately one sixth of human population, right, in one fortieth area is living. So what, what we conclude from this, number one, density of population in, in India is very high. Because, uh, right, <coughs> in, in, uh, just 2.5 units of land let's suppose there are 100 units of land and there are 100 persons living on this earth right it means one person dissolves one unit of land right so if india 
as having 17.5% of human population living here, then it means uh, India must be having 7.5% of the world's surface area under its control. But India is having only 2.4% population burden on India is 17.5%. On, uh, 17 so that is why one is the density of population is very high, right? And the second thing is that, uh, right, the burden of population on our natural resources is very high. That is why the per capita productivity in India is very low, right? Per capita productivity in our country is very low. And the third is that uh, due to the high density of population or, or due to the uh, excess burden of population on the natural resources of the country, there are the problems of uh, hygiene, right? So many diseases are uh, there, right? Pollution is rising in our country and there are some other problem, housing problem is there unemployment problem is there, right? So, and uh, because uh, population is very high uh, and the surface area is very less, density is very high, uh, unemployment is very high, right? Uh, employment uh, is a far dream today. So that is why all these things lead to very high level of uh, frustration among the people, right? So what happens when the frustration increases, then the other social problem increase, like, like terrorism is there, Naxalism is there, violence is there, law and order problems are there, right? And uh, the equity uh, the problem is there, right? And then uh, this we can say, right, Gundaism is there, right? Then what we say that uh, you can say that, uh, uh, that uh, pocket pickers are there, right? Purse snatchers, chain snatchers are there, and increasing rape accidents, which we are seeing, uh, rape incidents, which we are seeing particularly in the cities, right? So that is due to the frustration. So all these things, right? So hinder the sustainable development of the country, right? So this is the point, right? So this leads to burden on the foresters also. This leads to burden on the mineral resources also, water resources also. So that means uh, in all these respects, uh, which are the important, uh, uh, right, we can say veins of the entire system of sustainable development. So all that system is poor, right, because of the poor burden of the population. So the next point is that we are having 17.5% of world's cattle population. So more cattle population, right? It means uh, more, uh, you can say, pressure on the uh, those uh, grasslands, right? Grazing fields, right? And uh, uh, wilds also, forests also, right? And uh, the second thing is that uh, there will be more damage of crops also. And th third thing is that uh, there will be, will be more emission by the cattle, right? So cattle are the very uh, important emitters of the methane gas, right? So that is why uh, more emission of the greenhouse gases. So therefore, these three points are relevant in this context, which have been discussed by the uh, this uh, uh, government. Uh, right, which have been mentioned here by the government of India. So the next point is poverty. As far as the poverty is concerned, uh, let me give you some data. You please uh, note that uh, data, which is very important data, which I'm giving you today. Right, one is uh, 1.77 million households in India don't have a roof on their head. So still in the 21st century, we are in 2020 today and still 1.77 million households in India, right, don't have roof over their head. So please note it down. Very important thing, very important point. The second is uh, uh, more than 30% of India's population is living in poverty today also, right? 
more than 30% of India's population is living in poverty, even today also. So this is the second important point. And third important point is that 7% uh, of uh, population of India, uh, right, uh, doesn't has any access to electricity. Still in the year 2020, right, 7% of India's population don't have access to electricity. Right, so this is also very important figure. And the fourth thing is that uh, per capita household, uh, we can say consumption expenditure in India is low, right? So this is a very good measure of poverty that how much money do you spend on your consumption? Because this is the consumption which raises your living standard, not the money. If you are having rupees one lakh, so it is not going to save you from cancer, right? It is not going you going to right help you eating the healthy food until and unless you are not yourself prepared for eating the healthy and nutritious food. So that is why what makes you better, right? What uh, improves your living standard? That is not money in your pocket. That is instead the consumption which is done by you with the use of that money, right? It, it it can be food consumption also, it can be consumption of other household articles also, it can be consumption of luxuries also, etc, etc, whatever this thing, okay? right? So it is, a, it, okay, so it is very well said by someone that if you need luxuries, you need five planets. And if you need sustainable life, you only need one planet. Right, so this is very important quotation. If you want to put it in your essay anywhere or in your question, right? So it means uh, if you want luxuries of life, you need five planets at least. Earth is not sufficient, right? Earth is to make you sustainable living, uh, to provide you sustainable living, not to provide you luxuries, right? So if uh, you are thinking of luxuries, then obviously that would be at the cost of somebody else, right? Like we uh, we people are sitting here, right? So if I, uh, right, so whatever the resources we are having at a particular place, right? So those are sufficient for three of us to provide us a sustainable livelihood, right? But if it comes to my mind that no, I should uh, purchase luxuries now, so then what will happen? Because that uh, place where we three are living, that uh, does not allow right us to uh, purchase luxuries, right? So if I would think of purchasing the luxuries, then what, right? That that may be on the cost of the Ayman, that may be on the cost of Aman, that may be on the cost of someone else, X, Y, Z, whatever it is, right? So it means uh, uh, Arthur is a, Earth has enough to provide us sustainable living, right? If somebody wants to move ahead of sustainable living, uh, right, move beyond the sustainable living, then obviously we will have to grab someone's share. And when we start grabbing the share of uh, one another, then the right injustice and uh, inequality starts there. So that is why inequality is out of the lust for luxuries in human mind. That is basically there, right? So if we all want to live a simple, sustainable life, then the earth has, has enough for us, right? So, so that's why this is a very important line. So please bear this in mind, okay? So that will be important, okay? So the next, uh, uh, we are talking about the Consumption expenditure, I'm having 2018 figures here as far as the consumption expenditure is concerned. The first is Hong Kong, right? In Hong Kong's case, the per capita household consumption expenditure per year, right? That is 38285 US dollars. Means 38,285 US dollars are being spent by Hong Kong common household on average, right? that's there. Second is uh, in US, in US, 
the per capita annual consumption expenditure that is 37903 37903 that is the per capita annual consumption expenditure and uh, third is the switzerland their per capita annual expenditure household expenditure that is a uh, uh, consumption expenditure that is a uh, 28320 28320 dollars right and uh, fourth is uh, luxembourg l u x e m b o u r g luxembourg uh, luxembourg uh, 28761 28761 dollars right per capita uh, uh, per capita household consumption expenditure that is there and the next comes the norway in norway's case it is a uh, 25481 the next comes russia in russia's case it is 13321 13321 and uh, next comes their uh, brazil in brazil's case it is 7987 7987 right next comes sri lanka in sri lanka's uh, case it is a uh, 7780 it's zero okay and uh, next comes there that is the <clears throat> south africa in south africa's case it is a uh, six nine eight nine in south africa's case it is six nine eight nine okay and uh, six nine eight nine and the next is uh, china in china's case it is five five four eight five five four eight right and the next is india in india's case it is three nine six six three nine six six right so beta this is the small data small figures which i have given to you here some figures few figures few statistics right but according to this statistics first of all the world's uh, top five we can say right countries in terms of the per capita household expenditure right in us dollars right on the basis of the purchasing power parity so that is the hong kong one us two switzerland three luxembourg four and norway five right? these are the five countries if we see world's top country in terms of the household consumption expenditure so world's top country in terms of the household consumption expenditure right so that is we can see right world's top countries in terms of household that is the hong kong right so if the question is that uh, right asia's top country in terms of that so that becomes this uh, hong kong again right if it becomes that uh, among the BRICS countries right the top most country in terms of the per capita consumption expenditure household consumption that becomes russia right after russia brazil then south africa then china and fifth number India. because there are five countries in in BRICS, it means in the BRICS group right india is a country with which uh, right right which is a uh, uh, last in the line in terms of the per capita household consumption expenditure then in sark in sark sri lanka is the topmost country in terms of the per capita consumption expenditure then in terms of the bimstec b i m s t e c bimstec in bimstec terms also uh, sri lanka is the topmost country okay so that's why uh, this figure is important these figures were important okay so please bear this in mind right and uh, the next figure as far as this uh, we can say that uh, statistics which i am giving to you all right so according to this 76 million people in india right don't have a safe drinking water 
right so still today in today's world also 76 million people in india don't have safe drinking water number one right and the second important thing in this case that is sir uh, two more than two third of uh, of india's 718 districts the country has total 718 districts and more than two third of those 718 districts of india are affected by extreme water depletion right so water depletion is a big problem right so more in more than 200 no, sorry in more than two third districts of india right so water depletion is a major issue the next is uh, the economic burden of waterborne diseases on india annual economic burden of waterborne diseases in india is a uh, 600 million us dollars right it means uh, because there is problem of uh, water quality right safe drinking water is not available right so particularly in the rural india so that is why when you are not able to consume the safe drinking water then you have to consume the unsafe drinking water for survival right so when you consume the unsafe drinking water then you become victim of a number of waterborne diseases right so according to this uh, statement you can say right waterborne diseases that uh, due to the diseases right the economic cost in india economic burden on india due to the waterborne diseases only that is approximately 600 million us dollars right? so if means uh, only by providing safe drinking water to the villagers we can save 600 million us dollars right or the output to uh, or the contribution to the output of the country may increased by 600 million us dollars by only this effort right so this is next is the chemical contamination of water right mainly through fluoride and the arsenic two chemicals uh, which are uh, which are recorded in very uh, you can say uh, uh, the heavy concentration into the water fluoride and second is the we can say arsenic right so these chemical con uh, which contaminate the water their concentration is water is always high uh, right so uh, we can say this problem is present in 1.96 million uh, right we can say dwellings 1.96 million dwellings where people are, are living there the quality of the water is very poor and the arsenic problem is high very high in west bengal right that is there and 22 percent rise in school dropout uh, rates in a drought affected states yes i told you that uh, due due to the environmental effect uh, due to the environmental uh, damage degradation or climate change right uh, drought is becoming one of the features right and the drought is mainly affecting the agricultural families right and that is why they said that uh, in the drought affected areas the school dropout ratio has uh, rose to 22 percent 22 percent rise in the school dropout ratio this is a very uh, you can say worrisome figure right so it means this is the uh, we can say impact of these things on the general life or on this right school going children health etc etc what is there right and then uh, here it is given the human development index right this is also old index let me tell you the new figure right in terms of the human development index let me tell you that uh, human development index uh, measures three things related to our life one is health second is education and third is a uh, standard of living right so health is measured by the 
uh, average uh, that is the life expectancy what is the average life expectancy with that and uh, to measure this uh, education there are uh, many things like school dropout ratio etc etc and some other parameters are there and as far as this uh, uh, standard of living is concerned right so far that income is a parameter so so it means human development index is based on three things right health education and standard of living this is an important point second is human development index is prepared annually published annually by whom by the united nations development program which is known as a undp right so it is published by the united nations development program which is known as the undp so please bear this in mind right and uh, according to the this uh, human development index which was published in 2020 on the basis of the figures of 2019 because we can say that uh, 2020 is a very abnormal abnormal year due to the covid 19 right of uh, badly affected economic activities etc lockdowns and so on right but uh, in terms of uh, uh, but 2019 was a normal year there was nothing like covid 19 or, or anything else or any war or etc so that is why uh, i am thinking that 2019 data will be more relevant which has been published in 2020 by the undp so according to that that uh, uh, data right among the 189 countries for which the human development index is published india's position is 131 right india's position is a 131 and uh, india's points are 0.645 out of one right so it is measured its value ranges from zero to one right okay zero is a uh, very very you can say miserable very poor living standard right so development and uh, one top and uh, india's points are 0.645 those are the points of india right and uh, the important thing is that india is a uh, 100 india is at 131 31st position among 189 countries right yes but uh, if we compare it with the previous year's figure means 2018 statistics which was published in 2019 by the uh, this uh, united nations development program right so in 2019 report which was published uh, at that time india's position was 130th it means uh, india drops one india right india has slipped one position down right in terms of the human development index that means uh, if we are at 131st number among the 189 countries we can say we cannot say that uh, human development status in india is very good no it is it is it 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 is we can say a country which is in the middle category right in terms of the human development uh, this uh, index right so please bear this in mind if an examination statement is there that india falls in right low category or or india has been listed as a low category state on the basis of the human development index report that is wrong right india has been uh, listed as the upper category state in terms of the human development index report that's wrong right india has been listed as the uh, medium category state in terms of the human development index report that is true right so please bear this in mind and uh, this is there right so uh, now the next thing is that uh, life expectancy at birth in india it is 69.7 years and life expectancy at birth in bangladesh that is 72.6 years and life expectancy at birth in pakistan that is 67.3 years right 
So please bear this in mind that life expectancy in India is 69.7 years, nearly 70. And life expectancy in Bangladesh, that is 72.6. And life expectancy in Pakistan, that is 67.3. It means uh, like life expectancy in Bangladesh is higher than that in India. Please bear this in mind for your examination purpose. It's a good point, important point, right? So now the, uh, let me tell you that, uh, what do we mean by life expectancy at birth? Life expectancy at birth means, uh, let, let me take an example of, uh, you can say, our month, right? Right, so in, in the year when Ayman took birth, right, if those conditions prevail throughout her life, then on the basis of estimates, right, for how many years she will, she can survive on average, okay? Right, it means uh, uh, the time at which you take birth, right and the for the period in which you take birth the living conditions of uh, that period and if those periods uh, sorry if those conditions prevail throughout your life for how many years on average you can survive in those conditions that is the life expectancy okay at birth so life expectancy at birth is a uh, higher than India in Bangladesh, okay? So please note it down, okay? So the uh, next thing we can say here, right? So the world's top countries in terms of the human development index, let me tell you, though, not, though it is not a part of this lecture, but still I'm telling you. The top five countries are uh, top most countries, Norway. Norway is followed respectively by, by the Ireland, Number second, number three, Switzerland. Number four, Hong Kong. And number five, Iceland, right? So it means among the top five countries, there is one Asian country. That Asian country is Hong Kong, right? So please, please bear this in mind. If this is asked that, right? In the human development report of the this UNDP, right? So which, among the following Asian countries, right, ranked in the top five slots, right? Okay, top five slots. So uh, below the options can be given. It can be Japan first, right? Second option can be, let's suppose uh, Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, etc. Let it be Kuwait second position, second number. And third option, there can be, let us say this, uh, Hong Kong, and fourth option can be Singapore, right? So Hong Kong is among the top five. Okay, so please bear this question in mind. Okay, this is again an important question I'm telling you, All right? And uh, the next thing is that uh, fall in India's GDP, right? So India GDP has also uh, slided down. Right, slide it down means uh, in 2019, because I told you that I will not consider the statistics of 2020 because 2020 was not normal year due to the COVID-19. That is why I'm telling you the 2019 figure, right? In 2019, the per capita gross domestic product of India, that was a $6,681 per capita. It means total GDP divided by the total population of the country, that is the per capita gross, uh, gross domestic product, right? So that is a $6,681. But uh, in 2018, it was a $6,829. It means uh, India's GDP per capita has slided down in 2019 in comparison with that in 2018, right? So that means uh, overall, if we say that uh, there are many, many problems in India, poverty is there, unemployment is there, right? There is the problem of uh, safe drinking water, right? And uh, 
burden on natural resources is there uh, right so many people don't have a uh, roofs over their heads uh, right so so many things are there right on human development index also india is not a, a very good performer we can say so that's why in in all these contexts uh, right so this uh, uh, we can say the point that uh, this uh, sustainable development becomes important for india right the next it is give, it is mentioned that uh, india's priority poverty eradication and sustainable development these two are the important priorities of india one priority is poverty eradication second is sustainable growth because in the last to last lecture i think i told that right you cannot dream about sustainable development without poverty eradication right so if you are poor right so sustainable development won't be possible right due to a number of reasons right so those reasons i have already discussed but we will discuss somewhere ahead also right so these are the two uh, india's priorities right so now the next important point here is that uh, process for developing indcs indc means intended nationally determined contributions i am repeating again that uh, nationally determined contributions are the commitments uh, given by india in the paris climate uh, uh, in the cop21 that led to the finalization of the paris climate agreement india is a party to that right so the commitments by india those are called the national development uh, you uh, sorry uh, india so right nationally determined contributions so first thing is that uh, the nationally determined contributions were uh, finalized by india after multiple consultations with the various ministries with whose role was important niti aayog state governments industry associations civil society groups academic institutions and think tanks so those were the people who were allowed to participate in this right so this is the one point and one thing and uh, the second important point here is that peter let me take a call right so these were the persons who were next is consultations with members of uh, prime minister's council on climate change yes peter this is important thing again prime minister's council on climate change was constituted first time in india in 2008 when dr manmohan singh was the prime minister of india right so the purpose of this was to right provide a focused attention and to support the this you can say that uh, assessment uh, adaptation and mitigation uh, right action for the climate change so that was the main purpose because the climate change is seeming uh, uh, we are seeing that uh, climate change is there right it, it it is becoming inevitable in the present scenario so that is why we need to assess that uh, uh what is the uh degree of climate change first of all right direction of climate change 
and degree of climate change. And uh, so at, the, at the second place, we need to discuss or study that uh, how adaptation in the changed climatic conditions, right, could be ensured, right, could be made easier. And the third point is that uh, mitigation of climate change, right? So these are the, this is three pronged strategy. On the one hand, we should know, right, we should quantify the climate change and, the, and its consequences, right? And the second thing is in the short term, what we can do, we can think of adaptation. And in the long term, what we can do, we can think of the mitigation, right? So that is why Prime Minister's Council on Climate Change, right? So this coordinates the national plan or national action, right? Uh, related with the uh, assessment, adaptation and mitigation of climate change, okay? So this is there. It was constituted first time in 2008 and then uh, during this uh, uh, NDA government under Mr. Modi's leadership, right? So in 2014, this PM's uh, Council on Climate Change was reconstituted, right? And uh, obviously the Prime Minister is the chairman of this council, right? So it's task, I have told you that we can say, this is the important task of this Council of Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Council on Climate Change, right? Next is, uh, Prime Minister level consultation with ministers. This is India's, uh, how India evolved the intended nationally determined contributions, right? So based on existing and, contem and uh, contemplated plans, policies and programs, consultations with the ministries, national and state action plans for climate change lay, uh, right, lay the foundation and planning had over a 15 year frame in of five years, right? So this is the basis of our intended nationally determined contribution, particularly these two points, right? Number one, national plan for climate change, national action plan for climate change. Number two, state action plans for climate change. And number three, that is the 15 year time frame, not five years plan. So these two points, right? are very much important because the, these two points uh, are uh, the, uh, we can say, underlying points, right, of the this uh, India's intended nationally determined contributions, right? So in the intended nationally determined contributions, what is important point, interest of farmers and poor has been protected by the government. So these are the things, important points related with this. Now the next point related with this, the next slide, which is there. Leadership of Honorable Prime Minister of India uh, guided the process of formulating the India's intended nationally determined contributions. Ambitious target for, renew, for renewable and electricity to all. Right, number one, renewable energy. Right, renewable energy, what is that? 175 gigawatt renewable energy target by 2022, right? So total renewable energy target uh, of uh, this much gigawatt. So just one minute, pause bit of just one minute. Uh, so beta, we were discussing about this, the ambitious target for renewable and electricity to all. One is the 175 gigawatt renewable energy target by 2022. And this one is the 100 gigawatt of solar energy, 60 gigawatt of wind energy, 10 gigawatt of biomass, and five gigawatt of small, you can say hydro projects, right? <coughs> So these are the targets. <coughs> which are important for your examination. Right, so that is a 100 plus 60 plus 10 plus 5. Right, so please bear this in mind. <coughs> the total becomes 175. 
नेक्स्ट इज नाउ प्लीज वन मिनट पॉज बेटा प्लीज वन मिनट पॉज सो बेटा द वेरियस प्रोग्राम प्लान बाय इंडिया टू अचीव द इंटेंडेड नेशनल डिटर्मिन कॉन्ट्रीब्यूशन स्वच्छ भारत मिशन दैट विल ऑब्वियसली कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट in the uh, in mitigating the that uh, environmental impacts right or uh, that uh, environmental degradation right cleaning of rivers zero effect zero defect <laughs> zero effect zero defect is basically for the uh, you can say uh, that uh, uh, msmes right micro small and medium enterprises it is basically for that right so as far as uh, this is concerned the purpose of zero effect zero defect scheme is uh, is uh, to provide the technology to micro small and men and uh, that uh, medium enterprises with zero defect right means uh, state of the art technology right a zero defect technology and if the technology is good then obviously it's a, it's a environmental uh, consequences will also be not bad right so next next is making in the make in india smart cities mission housing for all so these are the various projects uh, right laid emphasis on sustainable development so all these projects are for sustainable development climate justice and lifestyle right so these are the important things so the next uh, important point here in this context that is uh, current voluntary pledges by india india's intended nationally determined contributions but peter please bear this in mind uh, that uh, in 2020 india had <coughs> had to revise its intended nationally determined contribution but due to some reason which i will tell you later on right so india has not uh, revised those uh, right india had not submitted those we can say revised uh, uh, targets right or uh, revised pledges or uh, that is the uh, nationally determined contributions right so current current voluntary pledge by india 20 to 25 reduction in the emission intensity of gdp by 2020 compared to 2005 levels it means uh, a <clears throat> emission intensity of gdp means emission of the greenhouse gases relative to the gdp that is to cut by 20 to 25% of the 2005 levels right <clears throat> next is a achievement 12% reduction between 2005 and 10 that was achieved right climate change pledge rutha india is confident of achieving this pledge unep emission gap report to recognize india as a chief of land air code so that was the previous targets right so which are not relevant today so the next is india's intended nationally determined contributions here one is the comprehensive and balanced <clears throat> includes adaptation mitigation requirement for finance technology transfer and capacity building right so india so intended nationally determined contribution there is one very important point which is there that is uh, adaptation mitigation requirement for finance technology transfer and capacity building all these points are there right <clears throat> so next is a uh, consider rapid growth considers rapid growth till 2030 because india has considered that the country needs to reach the uh, the country needs to achieve its growth potential yet right to cultivate its growth potential fully yet so that is why right rapid growth till 2030 that is uh, uncompromised we cannot compromise with that term. right so that is why the intended nationally determined contributions have been prepared keeping <clears throat> the need of uh, that uh, india requires rapid growth till 2030 right so for a population of about uh, 1.5 billion 
with 40% living in urban areas, right? So we have taken into account this also. In corporates, development priorities such as, what are the development priorities? Electricity for all, housing for all, poverty eradication, infrastructure for education and health for all, make in India, and then infrastructure development. These are the points, right? <clears throat> and the next thing is a goal. What is the goal according to the intended nationally determined contributions? To reduce the emission intensity of its GDP by 33 to 35 percent by 2030 from 2005 levels. This point is important. Please bear the point is in mind, right? So, what is the point? The point is that uh, we can say right to the point is a uh, right emission intensity to reduce by 33 to 35 percent right of 2005 levels by 2030 one is this okay so next is uh, avoid that is the emissions avoided emissions 3.59 billion ton of carbon dioxide equivalent to equivalent over bau bau means business as usual right that is there so 3.5 billion tons, we will, the emission avoided, right? So our national plan ambitions and, and a purposeful thrust on a, a national plan ambitious, right? Our national plans are made ambitious and uh, uh, we, we have a purposeful thrust on what? Renewable energy. We are promoting renewable energy in country, promotion of clean energy, and enhance energy efficiency. These are the three measures to right to lead to the green future. Right. One is the uh, shift from uh, conventional energy to renewable energy. One is that. Uh, second is a clean energy, and the third is a enhanced energy efficiency. Right. To enhance the efficiency of energy, so that there will be less consumption of energy, right? So that would also be uh, contributing into the uh, environment reclamation, right? And uh, thrust on renewable energy, renewable energy is that energy which is produced from the renewable resources. Renewable resources are that resources which can be renewed during the lifespan of the human being if we consume those, right? And, uh, <clears throat> but till now, we are focusing too much or we are depending too much on the non-renewable energy sources like the fossil fuels, coal, etc., etc. So those are the non-renewable things. So that is why our purpose is to shift towards the renewable energy so that uh, our energy consumption should be sustainable, right? The generations coming after us, right? They would be able to access the energy resources, right? So next is the climate resilient urban centers, right? So to develop such urban centers, right? So where the effect of climate change would be the least possible, right? Least impossible and a sustainable green transportation network, right? That is another uh, plan or a strategic action. Swachh Bharat mission, right? cleaning of rivers, zero effect, zero defect. These are the various measures which we are, have planned to take, make in India for sustainability of the country, right? So that's there. So now the <clears throat> next important point, which is here, right? So that is, so we can say, the next thing is high economic growth possible with low per capita emissions, right? So it is a, admitted in our this plan that the high economic growth can be possible right, with the low per capita emissions right so that is why what is there india's per capita emissions in 2030 right would remain lower than the current global average of developed nations 8.9 <clears throat> metric ton of carbon dioxide equivalent right so it means uh, 
what is the per capita emission that is 8.98 metric tons of uh, co2 <coughs> co2 of means carbon dioxide right so that was there in this the right per capita emission target sanjo so that's there right so the next thing is that uh, right the next point uh, which is there the next slide let me take it the next slide is to achieve the 40% of electric power installed capacity from non fossil fuels by 2030 it means uh, there will be 60 40 ratio please bear this in mind that by the year 2030 60% of the energy needs of the country would be fulfill would be fulfilled from the uh, renewable resources right uh, would be right uh, sorry 60% from the fossil and 40% from the non fossil right 60 40 will be there okay so a jump of 33% over non fossil fuel capacity of 2015 sorry india uh, running out of the largest renewable energy capacity uh, running one of the largest renewable energy capacity extension program in the world so we are running the world's largest renewable energy capacity we can say right programs in the world right so let me tell you better here in this context uh, two important things please note these down right so one is that uh, right so india is the setting up uh, the world's largest solar power plant india is setting up world's largest solar power plant right solar power plant right where let me write it here largest solar power plant at om kareshwar om kareshwar dam on river narmada in madhya pradesh so this is the one point right india is a uh, right going to set up and this world's largest uh, solar energy plant would become in operation by the year perhaps 2022 okay so this will be a 600 megawatt plant okay and the second important thing is that uh, India is uh, <clears throat> constructing or uh, building the world's largest uh, floating solar project. Okay, India is uh, setting up world's largest floating, uh, sorry, India's largest floating solar project. All right, India's largest floating solar project. of 100 megawatt at where that is the right ramagundam reservoir reservoir in telangana in telangana Please bear this in mind that the uh, world's largest solar power plant is being construct uh, is being constructed right by the National Thermal Corporation, National Thermal Power Corporation of India. Where that is being constructed at the Om Kareshwar Dam on Nar near Nar uh, which is built on the Narmada River, right? So that's point important. And second is world's largest, uh, sorry, India's largest uh, floating solar plant that is on Ramagundam res Reservoir in Telangana on River Godavari. Right? So these rivers and reservoirs are important. Right? Okay. So please bear this in mind. Right? So the next uh, important point here is that uh, 
uh, the 175 gigawatt target by 2022 will result in the abatement of 360 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. More progress after 2020. So the government's ambitious target of introducing or achieving 175 gigawatt energy from the renewable resources like by 2022, it will help in reducing the carbon dioxide emission, uh, carbon dioxide equivalent emission per year, which is 326 million tons, right? So this is a very huge figure to include wind power, solar power, hydropower, biomass, waste to energy and nuclear power. These are included in that plan, right? So that's that is that is important here in this respect, right? So let me move on to the next point, right? So the next slide, right? So on this uh, slide, first let me remove these points, right? So solarization of all petrol pumps, toll plazas across the country. That is the plan of the country. Ongoing schemes for development of twenty-five solar parks. Ultra mega solar power projects can all top solar projects means within the canals right on the canal and 100,000 solar pumps for the farmers. So this is the next scheme of the government right and uh, India to anchor a global solar alliance global so international solar alliance that has been set up at uh, this uh, Gurgaon right it was so uh, it is a joint venture of uh, France and India, and it was, uh, uh, you can say, conceptualized in 2012 during the, uh, sorry, 2015 during the COP21 when uh, the Paris Climate Agreement where was finalized. So in that uh, conference of parties, this International Solar Alliance was uh, declared and India and France are the two partners in that, right, joint, joint venture of that. So new missions on wind energy and waste to energy, those we are going to introduce. Green energy corridor projects being rolled out to ensure evacuation from renewable energy plants, right? So it means a green energy corridor projects are being rolled out, right? So that is the point, right? Because we are focusing on the renewable energy now. So that is, that is basically important, right? So the next, uh, Thing here that is the goal to create additional carbon sink of 2.5 to 3 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent through additional forest and tree cover right so carbon sink means uh, those particularly forests right so that uh, you can say absorb the carbon dioxide from the environment right okay and those are called the carbon sinks because uh, uh, the larger the uh, the bigger the size of the carbon sink right the lesser will be the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide into the atmosphere right so that's the point here right so additional sink this is to be created increase about 680 to 817 million tons of uh, carbon stock right carbon stock means uh, uh, like uh, the carbon which is absorbed and stored into the uh, trees plants that is known as the carbon stock right? so emphasis on india's plans to enhance its carbon sink right so how to enhance carbon sink full implementation of green india mission launched green highways policy one lakh forty thousand kilometer long tree line along both sides of national highways right so okay so planting trees on both sides of national highways. 1% of project cost to be year market for the plantation. Plantation along rivers, parts of Namami Ganga Mission. Right? Namami Ganga Mission for the rejuvenation of the Ganga River. Right? And plantation along the river and other rivers also. That's there. Right? So next is... Uh, Finance Commission incentive for creation of carbon sink 
devolution of funds to states from federal pool attaches seven to area under forest. But that, that was the old figure. But uh, in the new figure, right, uh, as recommended by the 15th Finance Commission, right, so this figure of 7.5% weight to area under forest, uh, that has been increased to 10%, right? So that means uh, to motivate the states, uh, right, to bring more area under the forest, right? Uh, thinking that uh, if the area under forest would increase, the states would get more grants from the center. So that is the point here, right? So reduction in consumption of wood biomass as fuel, right? Like uh, uh, PM Ujwala Yojana, right? Gas cylinders are provided to the BPL families, etc. Funds from Compensatory Afforestation Fund Management and Planning Authority, US dollar six billion proposed to be given to states, right? So the central government has proposed to give six billion US dollar to the states, right? So so that uh, they may uh, do the they may speed up the right afforestation efforts, right? Other policies include RE double D plus, right? Red plus. As far as the red plus is concerned, red is an abbreviation for reducing emission, deforestation, and forest degradation, right? Reducing or for reducing emission, right? And D for deforestation, second D for and forest degradation, red plus, right? So red plus, uh, this is a, we can say, right, this is a program under the UNFCCC, United Nations Framework on Climate Con uh, Convention, right? So that's the point there, right? So uh, the purpose is to creating a financial value for carbon stored in the forests, right? Financial value for carbon stored in the forests by offering the right incentive to developing states, right? It means a uh, red plus means the to incentivize those states, uh, right? Those countries that protect their uh, foresters that uh, by compromising with their development, right? You know, like uh, we can take the case of the Ecuador, right? Ecuador uh, is a South American country, right? So Ecuador planned to cut their forests, right? Because uh, uh, beneath the, that forest land, there is said to be very huge resources of reserves of the uh, fossil fuels, right? So to extract the oil from the land, they planned to cut their forests and clear the forests, right? The world pressure came on that Ecuador that don't cut the forests because those are required now. So Ecuador put that demand that, okay, we will not cut the foresters, right? So give us some money, right? So that we may not, uh, so that, uh, right? We may meet our developmental needs with that money, right? If you need forests, sir, right? We need the development, right? So, so if you want those foresters to be, uh, you can say kept in the same state, uh, right? Then let the developing world should pay us the money, right? So that we may, uh, you can say, right, carry on our development agenda. So that means uh, that this is the red plus mechanism. Under the red plus mechanism, what is there uh, to incentivize the, the states uh, which are protecting their forests, uh, which are uh, uh, not compromising with the uh, foresters, right, in the race for development. Uh, so to incentivize those uh, this red plus uh, mechanism has been introduced according to this uh, the value uh, sorry the carbon stored in the forest is that is that is valued right accordingly the states should be supported right or given the funds national agroforestry policy to promote the agroforestry right to increase the uh, productivity Joint forest management and national afforestation management. Those are the other programs which have been planned there. Right? So 
goal adaptation component to better adapt to climate change by enhancing investments in development program in sectors vulnerable to climate change particularly agriculture water resource himalayan region coastal region health and disaster management so india's goal uh, how to achieve those things right or uh, what is the goal of india because so far we have discussed that india has these plans these plans these plans these plans right what for what for uh, for mitigation of the uh, climate change effects right so now what can be done for that right so to better adapt to climate change how by enhancing investments investments in what in development programs in sectors vulnerable to climate change right so this is part of the adaptation means uh, the sectors which are vulnerable to climate change right so those sectors should be supported right right how to support those uh, sectors right so by enhancing investment in those sectors which are those sectors agriculture water resources himalayan region coastal regions health and disaster management means these are the areas right which may become uh, you can say highly vulnerable to the climate change or the impacts of the climate change on these areas could be more right so that's why high vulnerability of india to climate change impacts due to poverty and dependence of a large population on climate sensitive sectors for people yes this is very important pro, uh, statement what that india is highly vulnerable to climate change why two points important one point is that uh, india is a poor country we have a large number of uh, large percentage of uh, poor population significantly large percentage of poor population in our country right i told you that uh, poverty and sustainable development cannot live together so if uh, we need sustainable development then we have to right you can say drive the poverty out of the country so that's one point and second is uh, why india is more vulnerable because uh, a significant percentage of population of india is depending on the climate sensitive sectors climate sensitive sector is agriculture right climate sensitive sector is fishing right and uh, climate sensitive sector like we can say the tribal population that is entirely depending on the forest etc so so these are the climate sensitive sectors right so that is why if uh, if if anything like the climate change happens right so then this population would become the most vulnerable in our country and that is why right and the next point is that uh, strategies and initiatives include actions in in agriculture what where we need to focus attention right where we need to uh, take actions agriculture sector water health coastal regions islands disaster management protecting biodiversity and himalayan ecosystem and securing rural one is the agriculture right in the wake of the climate change right weather patterns are changing right somewhere we are seeing the extreme droughts and somewhere we are seeing the extreme floods right rainfall patterns are changing duration of rain is changing so this is going to affect largely the agriculture sector of the country so that is why adaptation or to save the agriculture sector or to uh, right seeing the vulnerability of the agriculture sector actions are required there second is water right water is depleting also quantitative problem right so as far as the quantity is concerned so the quantity of water is reducing in our aquifers right it means a water crisis right in the near period and second important thing is that the quality of the water is also degrading right as far as the quality of water we have already discussed that the fluoride arsenic content and other chemical contents are increasing and moreover if the if the quantity of water in the we can say aquifers reduce right then what happens the concentration of the minerals and other elements in the water per unit of water would increase 
so that means a quantity reduction means less dilution less dilution means more concentration of uh, minerals and other things in water right and that leads to the uh, poor quality of the water so water is essential for agriculture essential for our living essential for the living of the animal uh, stock also right so that's why water should be given attention this is a vulnerable part health an important thing right in the wake of the climate change in the wake of the ozone depletion in the wake of the increased warming right so all these things are going to happen coastal regions obviously if the sea level would rise right the sea would uh, eat away the coastal areas right so then the population which is living uh, in the coastal regions that would be threatened islands because in the wake of the rising right we can say sea level due to the increased global warming and uh, glacier melting right so sea level is rising so that's why the islands are very vulnerable in that in the wake of that disaster management yes we should we need to focus on the disaster management because in the wake of the climate change the disasters are quite possible right frequency and the intensity of the disasters may increase next is protecting biodiversity that's important because biodiversity is very important for living right man cannot live without the nature right so every part of the nature every you can say organism in the nature has role right in our life right so himalayan ecosystem and securing rural livelihood next uh, new missions on health and coastal areas redesigning national water mission and national mission on sustainable agriculture these 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 things india is doing india has set up an uh, indian uh, rupee 350 crore right national adaptation fund means uh, to work out the strategy and to take actions for the adaptation in the wake of the climate change right that required finance and for that purpose the national adaptation fund has been developed has has been set up by india right regarding its source etc we will discuss later on someday right and the next uh, point is that uh, okay so in the next point is that uh, to mobilize domestic and new additional funds from developing countries to implement the above mitigation and adaptation actions in view of the resources required and the resource gap. One thing is that better. First of all, let us discuss what is the resource gap. Because India has some mitigation plan, right? India has some adaptation plan that how to adapt, right? How to mitigate the effects of the climate change, right? So for that purpose, what are the total resources required? Let's let's suppose total resource, resources required are rupees 100. And what are the resources with us at present? Let's suppose we are having 60 rupees only. Right? So, so, so the difference between 100 and 60 rupees 40, that is the resource gap. Right? So now the point is that uh, for all these things which are uh, very much important, very much necessary, for all these things, we require 100 rupees and we are having only 60 rupees. There are rupees 40 resource gap, resource gap. So from where that resource gap we can minimize, we can cover, right? So for as far as that is concerned, right? So for that purpose, uh, we should take the support from the countries outside, right? One is that, right? Developed countries to take support from the developed countries right uh, funding support and moreover to mobilize the domestic resources also right so us dollar 2.5 trillion required for meeting india's climate change action plan between now and 2030 as per preliminary estimates so we have uh, worked out some estimates and according to those estimates we need 2.5 trillion dollars uh, for india's climate change action right what plan we have to chop down right so this is the money we require now what are the resources with us how we can uh, cover that resource gap that's there right 
so ratio of emission avoided per dollar invested and uh, right economic growth attained would be relatively more favorable in case of investments made in india so that means uh, for any investment which is made in india because indian economy has high potential so that investment would bounce back right so the ratio of emissions avoided per dollar invested would be more in india one point so that the foreigners may come into our country and the economic growth a day attained per dollar of investment would be more in india that is why it is beneficial for the investors to stay in india or to come and invest in india right so that's the point right so that will support our made in india initiative as well also right so the next uh, the next point there is a uh, right that is a uh, uh, the next is a uh, to build capacities create domestic framework and international architecture for quick diffusing of cutting edge climate technology in india and for joint collaborative research and development for such future technology so the point is that uh, whatever the plan we have talked out whatever the targets we have fixed uh, according to the indc of the country right so for that uh, we need the capacity building right so for that what is required domestic framework as well as the international architecture right for that what is required to us that is the technology is required to us cutting edge technology climate technology right and uh, joint collaboration in the search and development that is also necessary so that new and more effective and cost effective technology may be developed right cutting edge technology may be developed critical technology needed to be facilitated via gcf gcf means green climate fund we will discuss the green climate fund in, de in detail in the days to come in some other context right so uh, it green climate fund basically is to finance the developing countries right so the fund uh, contributions in the fund come from the developed countries so so the purpose of that is to uh, you can say finance the developing countries right to adopt the green technology clean technology etc etc right so global collaboration in the search and development is required and preliminary and the illustrative list of select technologies given in india's indc so in india's intended nationally determined contributions a list is given of the select technologies but that is not required for your examination purpose so no need to discuss it right so now the next is the uh, next goal is to put forward and further propagate a healthy and sustainable way of living based on traditional and values of conservation and moderation see uh, india's uh, way of living was very simple if we go in the past right so that was a uh, based on the conservation of nature that was a moderate way not an extreme way of living right so now uh, we need that healthy way of living sustainable way of living right instead of the modern way of living which is very luxurious which is very uh, expensive also right and uh, which is uh, creating damage to the environment as well so extra vegan lifestyle will require five planets and sustainable life lifestyle will require one planet right promote sustainable lifestyles based on needs based consumption so what is their need based consumption right there are in some houses better if you if you go right so then right so one lady is having 20 suits to wear right 20 garments right and uh, 10 sets of shoes are there right so 10 pairs of shoes are there right uh, 5 10 12 15 20 right we can say parcels are there right so that is not need based no? need based is that uh, right four five suits sufficient right two three pairs of shoes sufficient one two parts are sufficient parcels are sufficient right so that is the need based consumption right so there is need in india to shift from the right we can say that uh, uh, demonstrative consumption right demonstrative way of consumption to need based consumption right so we are uh, uh, focusing more on the demonstrative way of consumption right so we want to demonstrate and i can see i have this 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 right 
so that is why sustainable lifestyle is required right for that thing next is the clean economic development to adopt a climate friendly and cleaner right to adopt a we can say climate friendly and cleaner right oh let me move there now uh, sorry have discussed all these things na, so far yes so this is the to adopt a climate friendly and a cleaner right and a cleaner path this is there then the one followed hither to by others at corresponding level of economic development so this is our goal how we can meet the contributions nationally determined contributions that is the to adopt a climate friendly and cleaner path of development right as compared with the one followed by the corresponding levels of economic development other countries which are at the corresponding level of economic development for path they are following we need to right follow comparatively a cleaner path right so that's that's the point here at comparable levels of income india's growth path much more cleaner and greener and will continue to be so we want that second india's current per capita gdp in ppp terms means purchasing power parity purchasing power parity is is better let's suppose uh, in india you are having 20 dollars of income right and in usa some person is having 40 dollars of income right so the point is that uh, right so how many goods and services your 20 dollars can purchase in india and uh, how many goods and services those 40 dollars can purchase in america comparison of the two that is the purchasing power parity because otherwise in india we are having 1 lakh rupees per month salary right and in usa person is having 3000 dollars per month right so in the nominal terms there is huge gap salary in us is only 3% that in of that in india right so it makes no sense right if if in us right a person is living with 3000 and in india a person is feeling it difficult to live with rupees fun like so that so that is why the purchasing power should be seen of your income so that is there achieved at a substantially lower level of emission compared to developed countries right uh, per capita gdp in ppp terms is talking about right so that's there next is emission intensity of developed countries at similar economic level at india's today was approximately 0 0.9 kilogram this right so india's emission intensity the 0 0.36 right so carbon dioxide per dollar 60 percent less compared to the developed countries so that is uh, we need to work out right okay, how to reach there right now here is the uh, i think this is the last thing Conclusion, India's contributions represent the utmost ambitious action in the current state of development. First thing is that seeing the current state of development of the country, we have to move uh, far ahead. So that is why India's contribution uh, represent the utmost ambitious actions so that uh, we need development also and the environment is also equally important for us. It incorporates our developmental challenges and priorities. Those are incorporated in the plan. Recent decisions of the government represent a quantum jump in our aspirations and domestic and demonstrate our unparalleled vision. The various actions so, so far taken by the government in the wake of this climate change, right, in the context of this uh, mitigation, climate change mitigation efforts, right? So those are quite, uh, you can say, right, aspiring. Right, India's uh, development plans will continue to lay a balanced emphasis on economic development and environment. 
uh, right? So we are working out a strategy where there should be a complete balance between the two. Third, India expects an ambitious, equitable, and effective global agreement in Paris, right? So we need this, right? So uh, India uh, wants that ambitious, equitable, and effective global agreement in Paris because these were submitted in the Paris Agreement, which it was finalized in 2015 COP21. That's why last line is that uh, India is expecting that the agreement which will be concluded at Paris that will be equitable, effective, and more ambitious as far as the climate change is affected, right? So recent initiatives taken by the government, right? So what are the initiatives? First is renewable energy targets that, that we have already discussed, national solar mission, target under that 100 gigawatt, it's now, you can forget this. Kochi airport, world's first airport powered by solar energy. This is important point for your preliminary also. Solar powered toll plazas, Delhi Metro and other MRDS, right? And uh, uh, national smart grid mission and green energy corridors. We are working on those things in our country, right? So this is there, right? And uh, Next is Swachh Bharat Mission, Smart City Mission, Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation to make the uh, urban centers more livable, zero effect, zero defect, energy resource efficiency, green highway project, Fame India, which is the, that is the electric vehicles for those, right? Country's first passenger vehicle fuel efficiency standards finalized, National Air Quality Index was launched in 2014 in our country, right? So that's also important in this week. And uh, next is uh, from Pragat Krishi Vikas Yojana to promote the organic farming in our country. Pradhan Mantri Krishi Sinchai Yojana for efficient irrigation in our country. Niranchal for watershed development in our country. Namami Gange for the rejuvenation of the Ganga River. National Initiative for Climate Resilient Agriculture that has also been planned, uh, right? So to devise the agriculture technology strategies, seeds, crops in, in, in such a way that, that those may be the climate change, Bureau of Water Use Efficiency, and then Lifestyle and Culture of Sustainability. So that is there. And the climate finance policy, one is the National Adaptation Fund, which we have uh, set up there, from where the finance will come. It's answer to that, right? Reduction in fossil fuel subsidies, that is also saving of the funds, right? To put, uh, because of making, uh, right? It will help in two ways. Number one, saving the government funds, and number two, uh, right? Uh, less consumption of the fossil fuels, right? So that will also contribute into the uh, environment health. Right, positively. So coal has increased from 50 to 200 so that people should shift from coal to other sources. Tax-free infrastructure bonds introduced for renewable energy. Right, so renewable energy so that people may be attracted to invest in renewable energy, right, by purchasing the bonds and uh, whatever the yield on those bonds will be given to you, those there will be no tax on that. Right, so that people may become attracted towards this, uh, attracted for investment in this sector. Right, so that's there. Right, so that's the lecture is complete. So, okay. So let me stop the recording.